Hey everyone, welcome to a quick introduction to message brokers. This is going to be the first in a multi-video series where we just look at message brokers, messaging, uh, what it's good for, what it's used for, uh, and give some pointers and some code demos to show you how you can kind of build message-driven systems. So to dive in, I just figured we would take a look at the Wikipedia definition of message brokers. Uh, it's pretty detailed, talks about a lot of different concepts, uh, talks about them being an architectural pattern, something that mediates communication, uh, decouples endpoints, uh, provides message queues for multiple receivers, does reliable storage, guaranteed messaging, perhaps even transaction management, right? So it seems to be a lot of different concepts, pretty complicated. Uh, and so we're just gonna dive in kind of uh, slow and simple and, and, and understand basically how they work. So the problem we're looking to solve is getting two computers to communicate. So imagine we've got application one running on one machine, uh, application two running on another machine, and we need them to communicate somehow. Application one wants to send some information in some form to application two. And so the default approach we would typically take to this is try and open a network connection, have application one uh, access uh, application two through some kind of IP address and port combination, open a TCP connection maybe, and then just uh, push the data through. But it can actually be a little bit more challenging than that when we get into kind of more distributed systems. Uh, application two may not be running, so that might be our number one obstacle, is that it's actually not there to connect to. Uh, but also it might be running slow or its network might be slow, so it might not be able to push data through as fast as we would uh, want from, from application one's perspective. Uh, there might be a network firewall in between, so there may not actually be a network path between application one and application two that we can connect through directly. Um, and the other challenge is they may not speak the same language, right? So if, if these are both our applications, we've written both of them, but they're probably going to speak the same language. But if these are, you know, if you've got different teams, different people, different companies building different applications, uh, they may end up actually not speaking the same language entirely. And so uh, message brokers can serve as an intermediary for us. They can sit in the middle between application one and application two and solve some of these challenges for us. Uh, so now application one can send the information to the message broker and then that message broker can receive it and forward it on to application two. And so that first challenge that we had if application two is not running, uh, the good news is message brokers will have some form of storage. Uh, so application one can send that information as a message to the message broker. That message broker will store that up. And then when application two comes back to life, uh, the message broker is able to forward on those messages uh, to application two, and this can give us some good reliability in our communication. So even if application two is unavailable, we're able, application one is still able to kind of communicate with it. If the network is slow, if the application is slow potentially, again, that storage and the message broker is gonna come in use here. So application two being slow is similar to it being down, that message broker can store those messages uh, that it's received, but it can't yet send out. And when application two is ready to receive them, uh, it's able to send them on. So application one can push messages out real fast, the message breaker will store them up and forward them on at a slower rate uh, as fast as application two can, can actually receive them. The other challenge we had about the firewalls being in between uh, and so the message brokers can help us solve this challenge too. So we can put our message broker somewhere where it's accessible by both uh, of these applications. We could put it maybe on the internet, give it some kind of domain name or an IP address, maybe even a, a public one that, that we can access from anywhere. And that means all the applications that want to share information can connect out of their networks, which is typically allowed through firewalls, and out of their networks to the message broker uh, and open up those kind of TCP or those, those network channels. And then uh, once, once an application wants to share information, it can connect it to the broker, it can then share it to any application that's also connected to the broker. So here message one can send a message out through its firewall and we can see the arrow for application two now is connected the other way. They're both connected out into the broker, but that message is able to still flow through those two network connections. And the final challenge you talked about was what if they don't speak the same language? Uh, message brokers often can, can translate between different communication protocols. Uh, some intelligent ones can translate the contents of the message. Um, and we'll talk about that kind of further down the series, but for the protocol at least, uh, it's pretty common that message brokers can translate between multiple different protocols. There are actually some protocols specifically for messaging. AMQP, the Asynchronous Message Queue Protocol, uh, is a good one. MQTT and Stomp, there are some proprietary ones like Kafka uh, Protocol as well. Uh, so a lot of message brokers can communicate between uh, different ones of those. Uh, some will even speak HTTP and other kind of non-message specific protocols uh, to enable 
kind of all different kinds of applications to, to talk. So here we see application one sending something in through HTTP. The message broker translates that and sends it down as AMQP to application two, which can respond in AMQP. And then the message broker can translate that back to an HTTP uh, kind of call and, and, and pass that information back to application one. And so in order to make good use of a broker for us to understand and model the communication that happens, we want to have a good kind of model for, for what actually happens. And so the basic kind of communication structure that we use when we use message queues, uh, or when we use message brokers, sorry, is a message queue. Um, and queue, like when you're in a grocery store, like when you're doing programming with queues, uh, they are a first in, first out concept. Uh, and so if I send message one into a queue and then send message two to a queue, it should deliver message one before it delivers message queue. So the first one in will be the first one out. I like to think of these in a real world analogy as a single lane road. So the first car that comes into our road uh, is at the front of the, the line effectively. There's no overtaking or anything. So all the cars kind of queue up one after the other. And then as we allow things out, they, get, they leave that road in the same order they, they entered it. But in order for message brokers to be super useful for different applications, uh, we don't just have one queue. Message brokers typically have multiple queues, any number of queues. Uh, and so we can give our different queues their own unique names, and then different applications can send messages to different queues, and then we can have other receiving applications receive different messages from the different queues. And so here we've got uh, two queues in our message broker, Q1 and Q2, and then an applica different applications sending into them and different applications receiving them, which is also very useful. Uh, but uh, another really useful feature about queues is they aren't just one-to-one. -one. We don't have to have one sending application sending data into a queue and then one application receiving it. We have multiple people sending into a queue and those messages just get added to the queue in the order they arrived in, right? Same as that one name row, they just queue up in that order. And then the different receiving applications uh, are typically referred to when, we, when we're using message brokers, we refer to them as competing consumers. Uh, they receive the next available message from the queue when they ask for a message. So the first application that will uh, request a message from the queue will get the very first one that was sent to it. Uh, that'll come off the queue and go to that application. And then the next one will get the one that was behind that, the second message effectively. And they'll keep kind of uh, taking the next one from the queue. The important kind of guarantee here that the message broker provides is they won't get given the same message. So we can actually, if we want to like scale out our applications that are processing messages, we can just keep running more instances of them and they can keep connecting to the queue and taking the next message from it. And we know that they won't get duplicate ones. So we won't do duplicate work or take duplicate actions because of it. So this is a really important concept when we get further down into the patterns that make message driven systems work. Uh, work. But for now, this is just a basic understanding about the way competing consumers work and how, how different numbers of people can send to a queue and receive from a queue at the same time. The next logical thing to talk about after message queues uh, would be topics and subscriptions. These are a really important concept when we build distributed systems using message brokers. They are like queues in the fact that they're queuing up messages that get sent by one application before they get delivered to another one, but they're also a little bit different. They're also different between different message brokers. So message queues all generally work the same on all the brokers. Uh, when we get to topics and subscriptions, different message brokers can have slightly different implementations, especially when we get to different types of message broker. It's like the more traditional ones like Azure Service Bus or ActiveMQ or RabbitMQ, and then these kind of newer distributed log type ones like Kafka and uh, Azure Event Hubs. Um, they're very different, those are the last two uh, in, in how they work. And so we're gonna talk a little bit more about topics and subscriptions uh, in our next video. So that's all for this quick introduction to message brokers. Uh, we basically just covered what a message broker does, how it sits in between two uh, applications that want to communicate, uh, and then they can send information in the form of uh, short messages. It can kind of queue them up for them uh, and deliver them. It can queue them up uh, in separate queues, deliver them to different applications, um, and we can have all these different name queues on our message broker. Uh, so if you like this video, if you found it useful, hit like. Uh, hit subscribe so you can see uh, the rest of the videos in this series and also hit post notifications because I will be posting more videos. Um, if you want to see me on social media, uh, there are my two handles there. So thanks so much for tuning in and I'll see you in the next video.